<laughs> is it time for recess yet? I'm so glad you found time to join us here on the Child Care Director's Chair, where Erica Sococcio shares her best practices that she's refined through her passion of directing child care centers over the last 23 years. From parenting interaction, systems to save you time, money, and stress, to profitability. She shares it all from the Child Care Director's Chair. Hey guys, it's Erica here with the Child Care Director's Chair Podcast. We are so thankful you tuned in today. If this is your first time tuning into our show, welcome. If you are one of our daily loyal listeners, we love you. We love you, love you, love you. Thank you so much for tuning in every day and supporting our podcast. Child Care Directors, can we be honest? I have a quick tip. Not every family is going to be the right fit for our center. Just like our center isn't the right fit for every family. So our friends over at thrivingchildcare.com have created a quick checklist of 10 questions that child care providers should ask parents before enrolling them. It is very quick to get. It's downloadable. You can have it in your hands in about five minutes, and it's on sale for five ninety nine. I mean, just the headache alone, it's priceless. So visit our friends over at thrivingchildcare.com. Don't forget to use our special promo code, Child Care Podcast, all capital letters, and let them know that Erica from the Child Care Directors says hello. So this is actually a second interview um, with someone from Canada. We know that we have so many listeners from Canada and that support is amazing. And we wanted to make sure that we continue to bring content that was equally valuable to both our Canadian listeners and our U.S. listeners. And of course, our listeners all over the place, but there's just so many of you. It just made sense to do that. The other thing is, I think it's so important for us to kind of come together collectively as a voice in ECE and support each other and learn from each other. And so um, that's why I thought this would be a great follow-up as well. So um, we're going to hop into it. I have a guest today and her name is Kayla and I'd love to welcome her to the show. And I'm going to give her a minute to talk a little bit about herself. So welcome, Kayla. Thank you so much for having me, Erica. It's so great to meet you too, finally, in somewhat person. Somewhat person. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice when you're able to put a name to a face. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll just dive right in then. Dive um, in. My, <laughs> my name is Kayla Papalia, and I am I currently live in Port Moody, British Columbia, which is all the way in the West Coast of beautiful British Columbia, a suburb of Vancouver. I'm sure everybody must know where Vancouver is or whereabouts it is. And I have been an early childhood educator. I want to say I'm coming up on 12 years now. Um, but I would say I'd probably be an early childhood educator longer because I grew up in a what is known here in Canada as a family child care. So my mom uh, had a child care when, in our house uh, when, uh, when I was growing up that she still operates to this day. And uh, in all my roles as an early childhood educator, I have worked for private child cares, I've worked for nonprofit child cares, and back in 2021, I decided to open, again, what's known here in British Columbia as an in-home multi-age child care. So basically that means that I have opened my home to uh, seven children, well, six children, because two are siblings, <laughs> seven families, uh, sorry, six families seven children uh, here in my home and um, I've been doing that since 2021 and I love it. It's been amazing. It's been such a great way to be able to merge two things that I love, which is first, the ability to stay home. Secondly, <laughs> the ability to, uh, you know, help serve families in the community as well as continuously use my, uh, my cap as an early childhood educator in a way that's not only going to help benefit uh, children and families, but also gives me the power and the empowerment to be able to do things how I see fit. I love that. Um, I love all of that. So, and I'm I'm so happy that you are um, a family child care provider because we have a lot of listeners on the show that also run their own business from from home. And there's and there's so many ways to do early childhood education. And so I want to make sure that we have a voice for everybody um, and represent everybody to the best of our ability. So thank you so much. And I thought, you know, I really wanted to talk about when we we talked on Instagram a little bit. You know, we thought, well, this would be really cool to just kind of like talk about what are the differences between child care practices in the U.S. and Canada. And for me, my hope 
to get some insight is a little bit around, I have to tell you selfishly, a little bit around funding and how how you guys do it there. Because I know your government is is pretty involved in the ECE field in terms of funding. Is that still true if you run a family child care center? It is and it isn't. So I, I would like to preface this by saying that the motions and the movement that has happened in early childhood education since I want to say 2018, 2019 um, have been positive and have been beneficial. There have been some wonderful changes that have come about. Um, and I would say that this is the first time ever, uh, quite frankly, that we have actually seen um, government involvement and understood the importance of the early years um, in, you know, for, for children and their families. Having said that, I would say that as an in-home multi-age operator, or if you run a private um, childcare sector, so meaning, you know, one that is not uh, a non-for-profit, I would say that we still have a long way to go because I don't think we are seen, we are as valued or we are seen as important as the non-profit sector. Okay. Um, I, I feel like, too, when there's one one style that is maybe looked at in a way that is, as preferential, I guess, um, I think it really should be family's choice as to what feels good for them, right? So you, you kind of take a little bit of that away, right? I think families should be able to pick what is the best setting, whether they want to do a, a smaller setting like a family child care because I like that intimacy of that, especially for young children, right? I totally get it. Or you want to do a small center, a midsize center, a large center, you know, a franchise, like whatever feels right for you. Because at the end of the day, it is about the children, <laughs> right? Absolutely. And, right, yeah. So I, I think that that's important. I, I, I wanted to really explore the the practices around how that works because my government is kind of getting into now and I think you're right probably around the same time because it's been a global conversation around early childhood right because parents are also like hey you guys need to you guys need to be part of that and you need to talk about because my government also is moving towards state funded pre-k and the push for universal pre-k in in the US and so that is like kind of a little bit all over the place. Yes, it's a good thing, like you said, to have more access for children and families and choices, but we have to figure out like, how is it going to be funded? One of the things I learned was, and I'm not sure if this is exactly the case for you folks, but centers are still closing down because they don't have enough money because the money is maybe delayed or something to that aspect. Is that what you're finding there? Yeah, so um, I'm not sure exactly how it is because i believe you said that the person that you spoke to beforehand from canada I'm not sure who that is um was uh based out in toronto so that's mm -hmm. in ontario yeah. which is a province from us um but in british columbia what we have right now is something called the fee reduction incentive or something else that is the ten dollar a day plan um in british columbia and now canada wide they've been really pushing something called the ten dollar a day plan and the Essentially what it is, is the understanding and the, um, the hope that families would not be paying more than $10 a day for childcare. Again, that's a fantastic, wonderful thing. We don't want families to be playing an arm and a leg for something that is so essential, not only for children, but also for parents, right? It's particularly mm -hmm. women. We know that if women are able to access good quality, well-funded childcare that they're not paying mm -hmm. so much out of pocket with, you know, they're able to go back to work, they're able to go back to school, and our economy does better, which mm -hmm. doesn't like that. That's a fantastic thing. But again, the problem that I... The problem that I see is that it prioritizing and demonizing, I want to say, um, and creating a divide really between what they see, what government is seeing as quality childcare and not quality childcare. So right now, from what I've from what I've seen and from what I've read and from all the town halls that I've been able to attend, there seems to be this idea that's being put forward that nonprofit is good and private is bad and private of course also falls under you know also falls women like myself who run in-home multi-age centers or women who run family child care centers and so what i've been noticing is a lot of us who are running you know these private centers quote unquote we're not being prioritized and we're not being understood as to why we have to charge the fees that we charge um mm -hmm. on a month-to-month -month basis depending on the age of the child so for example 
let's say you have a child who is between the ages of zero to 18 months, right? So an infant. Let's say um, to cover all the expenses that I would need to cover so that I could make my program run, I need to charge $1,200 a month for an infant, right? Well, now I have to apply for this fee reduction so that I'm able to, as an in-home multi-age childcare provider, receive $600 of that fee redu- of that um, monthly uh monthly cost, right? So $600 of that is going to be uh, coming from the government and $600 of that is going to be paid by the family. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the point of fee reduction is essentially what it says to reduce mm-hmm. the fees uh, for, for families. But the problem that we're seeing is that they're lumping us all into this group of saying, well, you're not allowed to charge those fees. You need to keep your fees low. You need to keep your fees low. There's no understanding that childcare operations are not cheap nor do they come from nowhere, right? We need to charge a certain amount so that we can keep things going. It's not that we want to charge a ridiculous amount. And I would go as far to say that if you are a quality childcare provider, you understand that you don't want your families to pay an arm and a leg. But at the same time, we cannot get, you know, we cannot escape this, the fact that it's expensive to operate and it has to come from somewhere. So I need to charge what I need to charge to be able to make my center run. But now I have, you know, the, the, what we have here is the, um, uh, Ministry of Education right now is where our is where childcare is under, telling me that I can only charge set amount. So that means that now I'm not going to be able to maybe provide lunch program that I that I once offered that I once had. I'm not maybe not be able to provide a snack program. I might not be able to give my educators a raise. I might not be able to do you know so many different things because now I'm tied to a very limited fund in order to get this money to help my families out. And because of that, I personally have been noticing that a lot of centers are making the flows because they just cannot make things operate with um, the rules that are being set out at the moment. Yeah. Wow. There's a, there's a lot of things there. So the first thing is, you know, they, they talk about trying to get people to work so they can work and help the economy, but most centers are women owned. Most teachers who work in those centers are women. So it's almost contradictory in what we're saying and then what we're doing. Um, and that's across the board. That's not just, that's, that's here in the U.S. too. You know, we're advocating for educators who had to get degrees, right, and had to do all of these things to make, a, you know, a living. But as you said, where is, the, where is the money coming from? So maybe perhaps it isn't just, I think it's both. So I think it we're missing half of the puzzle. So, yes, the fee reduction for families, 100%. We're all on board. Oh, where absolutely. is that? Right. Uh, yeah. Where is the um, stability, the consistent stability fund to also pay the teachers what they deserve? And as you said, you know, the overhead. And I don't know the the, the actual expenses to run a, a family child care, but I could tell you from a center perspective, you know, it, they're pretty high. Like I don't have like, especially when you're renting, like if you own a building, maybe it's a little bit easier. So I own a few buildings and then I rent some buildings and rent keeps going up every year. You know, like the, uh, your, your, our utilities here in the U.S. are insane. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> so it's, yeah. So I think to have not only educators at the table, but financial experts, grant experts, on how are we closing these how are we closing these these gaps so the centers that are closing what is happening where are they going where are the children going where are the parents going where are the where are the teachers parents, going parents are getting stuck um and that's the sad reality and that's one thing that i that i really have a beef with um our current media right now and this is where i'm going to sound like a crazy person but our media is very one-sided i've noticed in the sense of we're just talking about how wonderful everything's becoming but we're not talking about the problems that we're having at hand or who it's affecting because the sad reality is that yes centers are closing drastically educators are leaving in droves we have a um we have an educator shortage here in bc never mind the rest of the country but in bc alone we have an educator shortage and what's happening right now as well is the government solution to that doesn't seem to be well we should give higher wages we should look at the problem we should see what the root cause of everything it's we're continuously slapping band-aids on broken legs and the bubble is going to burst and I'm very fearful of what that's going to look like when it eventually does. And the people who are suffering at the end of the day are children. Yeah, um, I, I totally agree. So it, so it seems like we are all globally having the same issues. The same thing is happening here. It's, it's hard to get teachers. We have to be more 
creative and bringing in people who aren't in the field, bring it, you know, kind of enticing them to come into the field. And I do also agree with the media part, except for here, it's the opposite. I feel like on the media, all you hear every day here in the U.S. is the child care crisis, the child care crisis, the staffing crisis, the staffing shortage. I, I can't remember the last time I seen any good news about early childhood education in the media, right? So I do believe also it's one-sided, but here it's kind of the opposite. And and yeah, we do have a, certainly a child care crisis. There are child care deserts, as they call them here, where you can't even get into a center because there, there aren't any. <laughs> or, you know, there's like three in your city and they're all waitlisted for eight years. Um, oh, so yeah. So might as well just say that there's not, right? Yeah, it's the same issue here, right? I mean, we have crazy waitlists. Like, me alone, um, I don't have any space, and that's assuming that I'll even have a spot open. I don't have any space open until September of next year. Um, yeah. And even that's looking pretty slim. I, I personally don't think I will have any availability for September yeah. of next year for any new families. And, you know, it's it's the same across across the, the province. We have so many people and so many people on wait lists and desperately looking for childcare and saying, like, you know, we've been calling since the mom mm-hmm. was, you know, newly found out she was pregnant because her mm-hmm. friend or her whoever told her, you need to start looking for daycare now. And there's no there's almost no hope for them to be able to find child care and I mean it's such a like I said it's it's such a situation and such a problem that is not as simplistic as we would like it to think it is I mean there's so much that goes behind it right I mean I would love for the solution to be as easy as we need to have more educators or we just need to put more money Mm -hmm. here or we need to do this or we need to do that but there's a root cause as to why we're having the problems that we are having and unless yeah. we can really focus on what that is, I personally don't see it getting to where we want it to be. And it's like you said, right? I mean, we there are such wonderful advances that are happening right now, but it's not enough. And it's not, it's prioritizing certain centers or certain people and almost villainizing the rest of us. So the what I've always said is the the um the idea that's happening right now in BC is wonderful, but the execution is not the greatest. Yeah. And I, I think I really wanted to talk about it because it does seem as though the U.S. is kind of following suit in terms of the government getting in and funding early childhood, which again is important, but how are we going to do it where it makes sense for the millions? And you think there's a shortage now? I, I'm telling you, <laughs> I, I told parents at a, at a parent meeting, probably about a year and a half ago. And we were talking about, I don't know, we're talking about toddlers biting, which is, was so not really connected to what we were talking about now. But I said, I looked at the parent, I said, there are so many things going on in our field right now. Do you understand that the child care uh, in our gov- in our state is about to collapse? And she said, what do you mean? I said, this industry is about to collapse right now. Teachers are working their butts off. They are, you know, this was like maybe a little bit towards the end of the pandemic, but wasn't quite quite there yet i said i am so happy that these girls are coming in every day they are here every day for your kids literally eight hours nine hours a day they are doing absolute the best that they can to understand where we are right now (laughs) like i'm sorry but i understand it's important to you we're doing everything we can and um they really didn't I, it wasn't really in the news as much as it is now. They, they, I think they had no clue. They had no clue. And I was like, this is why it's so important that we really help parents understand. Because when parents understand, right, because you and I, we have ulterior motives. We own our businesses. So people are going to look at that as like, well, of course you want us to fund your business. What other businesses do people fund? Okay. <laughs> we get that we're privately owned. We get that, right? But when you get parents to advocate and parents involved, it's a different conversation because they ultimately are the end goal person to help, right? Them and their children. So when you get them saying, no, we want choice. No, we want to be able to go to a family provider or no, I want to go to the the small center down the road or, you know, or a church setting or whatever, like whatever it is that they want, they should be able to have that and be able to pick what education, just like people do when the children are older, right? Yeah. You get to yeah. pick, right? You get to pick. So what about, do you think like, any cultural influences or anything influences the way that childcare is shaped or early education is shaped where you guys are? Are there any cultural influences, positive or negative? Oh, there's a, there's a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I would say your experience. Yeah, definitely. I would say that in terms of philosophy, yes, definitely. Um, it really is dependent on, yeah, I would say what it is that people are looking for, right? I would say certain cultures are definitely hoping for more academic style childcare centers, whereas others are looking for things that are more play-based. Mm -hmm. And again, it's exactly like you said, right? It all comes down to choice. Um, I think there are, and, and education as well, right? There are certain people who think that, you know, children children are in order for them to be successful in life need to have academics from the very beginning right so i know in certain um areas here in british columbia there is a huge push for montessori style uh child care settings right but i always say montessori is such a, a such an umbrella term here in british columbia i can either be the way that you see it with the mommy bloggers with the you know aesthetically beige houses or it's an academic approach there doesn't seem to be at least in my opinion uh, and again this is fully my opinion because I am not a Montessori educator by any means, but there seems to be no real understanding, I guess, as to what a Montessori program is. So there's a push for Montessori, but it's also dependent on what your interpretation of Montessori is. And then there is another push. Um, there, so we seem to kind of have this like one or the other. There's also this huge push for uh, a Reggio inspired, mm -hmm. right? Or a um, uh, emergent uh, curriculum. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, we all kind of agree that play-based is a good way to go about it. But how how that play happens, I guess, is where the, where not the divide, but the, um, the differing opinions happens. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I think too the materials, what the you know what the materials are, how frequently are they offered, how yeah. much is teacher directed, how much is child directed. Um, I, I think, would also you know, say too like how um, what's the word I'm looking for? How comfortable parents are with risk play? Like that's a huge yes, thing, right? yes, if right. You're going, if you're going to the more like uh, crunchy centers, for lack of better words, there is more. Uh, there's the opportunity for risk play, right? Where children mm -hmm. are encouraged to climb, they're encouraged to fall, they're encouraged yeah. to do, you know, they're, uh, you know, I worked in a center years ago where we gave children power tools in a safe setting, mind sure, you. Sure, sure, of course. But we, but we showed them, right? Like, this is how you use a screwdriver. This is how you, or not a screwdriver, use a yeah, power drill. This is how mm -hmm. you use this. And we showed them that, you know, they were capable of doing these kinds of things so long as we taught them how to be safe with it. And then you have other centers where that's just absolutely a huge no-no because you know what if a child gets hurt and we're going to have to deal with it and we're going to have to deal with angry parents so we're just going to make everything safe and you know so that nobody gets hurt or so we can minimize you know how many children get hurt because we don't want uh we don't want to deal with the the consequences of a a child getting hurt and b an angry parent. Yeah, so th that really speaks to why choice is so important. Totally. You know, yeah. What about parental leave? What does that look like where you are? Stay with us. We'll be right back. And so used to having everything in front of them right away that we forget that innovation just takes time. I, I myself, I get frustrated too. Why? And you know this as being one of my best friends is, hey, I talk to you all the time. Hey, man, I'm frustrated in the fact that I can't, seem to just get there in mm -hmm. the next day. But that's just not how these things work, right? Innovation needs to be planned out. It needs to be very methodical. And then when it finally hits, that's when it seems like to everyone else that it, it sort of just came out of nowhere. But to you, you know the amount of dedication that it took over that time. It is a question that I'm so glad you asked. Because, so, I mean, since since you just had a baby, <laughs> yeah, that's why and, I asked it. <laughs> you know, and this is a great question because this is a huge issue that I had and something that I talk about with a friend of mine who is also an entrepreneur here in British Columbia, who's a mom of three children in the earlier sector of all things as well. So Canada is really well known for having parental leave, right? We give women one year or they can take up to a year and a half um, of mm -hmm. parental leave. And, you know, we're very proud of ourselves because we offer that that's wonderful if you qualify for it i unfortunately did not qualify for parental leave despite the mm -hmm. fact that i pay taxes and mm -hmm. that i have been working since i was 15 so that would mm -hmm. be what 10 years of my life now yep because um, you own your own business correct yeah and yep. before then right i i started working when i was 15 years old because i got a part-time job when i was in high school because i wanted to start making mm -hmm. my own money because i wanted to go out with my friends so here in BC, when you start, um, when you pay taxes, you pay into something called employee, employment insurance or EI. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the 
the point of EI is that if, um, you know, uh, you ever need it, like if you are, if you get fired, I'm not fired from a job, but if you had to leave a job or for whatever mm -hmm. reason you needed something just to help supplement you while you were in between jobs, you would be able to tap into this money or you would be able to tap into it if, uh, again, if you're going on a parental leave, right? I was told that um, I called our Lord and Savior, which is uh, in, in the U.S. I guess would be the the equivalent would be the IRS. Here it's called mm -hmm. the CRA um, or the Canada Revenue Agency. So I called them up and I was like, "Hey, I'm I'm about to have a baby. I, I get maternity leave, right? This is all my information." And they told me that because I had not paid into this employment insurance for two years as a self-employed woman, I did not qualify to get maternity leave. And if you are a self-employed person, much less a self-employed woman, your maternity leave, if you qualify, you only qualify for 12 weeks. So 12 weeks for those of us who are self-employed, if we can even, um, if we even are qualified for it, but mm -hmm. everybody else gets a year to 18 months. Mm -hmm. So similar story here without the baby, um, but similar, similar issues here. So if myself or my husband, cause we're married, um, we're not able to collect unemployment or any benefits through unemployment because of that same issue. There's a tax they don't take out. And so if God forbid we close our doors and we found this out through the pandemic, uh, we close our doors or we had to close or, or my husband becomes disabled because he is married to me. Cause I, me and my sister own. Yeah. Me and my sister own our business together. Cause he is married to me. He is not entitled to that. So you or your spouse who is an owner, cannot collect. So similar, ours is, ours is not around maternity leave, but the same, the same similar situation for me here in the state. So That's we have insane. no access to any of those support services as a self-employed person. See, I have yeah. to say that thankfully that, that is where we differentiate because my husband is not self-employed. Um, he works, you know, for somebody and thankfully mm -hmm. I am able to get his benefits through work. Mm -hmm. So my our, myself and our daughter were able to get his benefits. And if God forbid something ever happened, he is able to tap into whatever government service he is paying into right now. I unfortunately don't get anything, but he is he able does. to yeah. get those things. Um, and he is able to take a picture up paternity leave if he, if he wanted to, thankfully for yeah. us, we were able to make it work so that I didn't, you know, I was able to take the time off for as mm -hmm. long as I needed to. And uh, that he didn't have to take that time off. So we were very fortunate and privileged in the sense that we were able to make that work. But it doesn't mean that I was still not happy about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so fun fact, our editor, Derek, is ready to have, well, I guess his wife. <laughs> his wife, my niece, they're having a baby in a couple of weeks. So that's very, very exciting. exciting. They're first and they're, they're taking some uh, time off as, as well. So very excited about that. So before we start to wrap up, let me ask you a quick question because you're, you're certainly very passionate as I am about our, the whole, the whole field. Tell me what ways do you advocate where you're at or what methods or uh, do you advocate if you do, how they like, talk to me a little bit about advocacy. Yeah, definitely. Um, so my advocacy platform is called EC Honestly, and that is on Instagram and Facebook. And that's where you can find us, uh, or me, I should say. <laughs> um, and I am kind of known as a pot stirrer. I have upset many people because I like to, to my mind, I would hope in a respectful manner. And of course, you know, when we have opinions, we are going to upset people and not everybody is going to agree with us. And that's mm -hmm. fine. People are free to agree or disagree with me. I love having conversations, but I also don't like sugarcoating anything. And I believe that in at least here where, where I am geographically, let's say we have created this culture of toxic positivity where we're almost not allowed to speak about why we're upset about certain things or why we disagree with certain things. And we're we're just supposed to be happy all the time and be grateful that things are not as bad as they were. My answer to that is always, you know, yes, I am thankful that things are moving forward, but we can, we can still be critical. Let's, you know, let's, let's call it critical about, you know, how, how this movement is happening and who it's still not benefiting and who is, um, who's being prioritized and who's being looked down on or who is not even being considered. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I think that um, we all should be using our voice. And I think, too, I think always 
because I do think about things very positively, but I think that all feedback is good feedback and that's how we are able to grow. So the more voices that you get to the table and the more folks that are, you know, giving some solutions, right? Because if everybody's at the table, like, yeah, this is great. This is great. I mean, it's not really working for everybody, then it's not great. So you do need to have all those different perspectives at the table. And I, I would say, you know, family child care is probably, I agree with you, probably the least considered. And then after that is after school programs, which is where I, I started. And the, the, the lady I was talking to earlier, she runs an after school program as well. And like, we're like, you know, like this, like the step kid of ECE, you know, like we don't know where we really quite fit in, right? We're not with the youth folks and we're not in the ECE spot. We're like right somewhere in the middle. So um, I think it's important to have all of those folks at the table. So Definitely. thank you so much. This has been so fun and interesting. I really uh, love learning about uh, what's going on in Canada. And I do think that we can continue to work together and learn from each other and figure out how do we solve this? Because this isn't a U.S. problem or a Canada problem. This is a this is a global issue and one that we we need to continue to fight for and advocate because our kids are worth it and our communities are worth it. And that's at the end of the day, that's why I'm here. That's why you're here and that's why we keep showing up. So Absolutely. with yes. So uh, we're gonna put your link down below in our show notes so folks can check out your podcast. And I just want to say to my listeners again, thank you so much. I am so humbly grateful for all of your support and tuning in day after day. Like I don't even know. You guys talk to me and listen to me more than my than my family sometimes. <laughs> um they're like stop talking about EC. I'm like I can't I'm obsessed. I'm sorry. Um, so guys, you nonstop. <laughs> yeah, nonstop, nonstop. You get it. So it is the little things, the little details that make a big impact in the success of your child care business. That's all for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. And as always, have a great day. Well, all the cute little kiddos have been picked up and it's time to go home. And that'll do it for another episode of the Child Care Director's Chair. Please leave a review so Erica knows the information is helping you to manage and improve your childcare centers. Remember to subscribe to get the latest episode from Erica's Childcare Director's Chair. <laughs>